Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to our esteemed uh, speaker and guest, Dr. Daryl Bach. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? I hope you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed because we are ready to roll, all right? So I'm just going to dive. Usually I do a whole thing on sports and background and get acquainted, etc. but they've got me under the clock and the clock is ticking. So I'm just going to dive right in. So um, if you have your, well, no, you can't even say open your Bibles. Let's just take a look at culture and how it how it was in the beginning, and it and basically goes like this. In the beginning, there were no books. In the ancient world, in the time before the printing press, uh, very few copies of anything were made. And the way in which accounts, I like that word, by the way, Greg, I always think about, do I, am I telling stories or am I telling accounts? Accounts is a good word. I have to save that one. Anyway... Uh, when we're thinking about accounts and the way accounts of people's lives were basically passed on in the ancient world, it was done orally. And what I want to do for you is to talk about the period between the events of Jesus' life, which took place around the year 30, and their recording in the Gospels that we read in our Bibles, which starts around the 60s and goes to the 90s. So I'm talking about a range of time that runs anywhere from 30 years to 60 years, depending on which gospel you're talking about. And it's an important gap that we have to pay attention to that most people never even think about. Because we just assume it's in the Bible so it's true. Now I need to tell you that our culture is changing, in case you haven't noticed. And one of the ways that it's changing is, is that the church is used to saying it's true because it's in the Bible, because we believe the Bible is an inspired word of God. But I'm here to tell you your neighbor doesn't necessarily share that view. They don't regard inspiration as a category that they process or think about. And so the question is, how do we talk about this material that's in the text, and how do we deal with this gap? Because what skeptics say about the gap goes something like this. Yes, there were events back there in the life of historical Jesus, but by the time we work our way down and through to the time when they are recorded, things have changed. In fact, Bart Ehrman, who teaches New Testament at the University of North Carolina, has written the most popular textbook that circulates about the New Testament in universities across the country, has compared the transmission process from event to recording and has compared it to a thing called uh, the telephone game. Telephone game is this thing where you tell a story at the start and they whisper it to the next person, the next person, the next person, the next person. By the time it gets down to the end, the story is very different from the story you started off with. I like the name they give this in, um, in Oceania, in, in Australia, New Zealand, and in China and the Asian Pacific Coast. They call it Chinese Whispers. Okay, that's just a far better name than the telephone game. And so... So we've got this gap that we've got to deal with. Now, a little experiment here, okay? Let's see, see how well-traveled Floridians are. How many of you have been to London? Look at that. All right, that's great stuff. Everyone should get to London at some point in their life. And if you know, there's that little place in the subway, there's signs all over the subway that go, mind the gap. Okay? Well, they don't say it like that. You know, I'm from the South, so I say, mind the gap. Okay? That's not how they say it in Britain. They say, mind the gap. Okay? <laughs> mind the gap, please. Okay? So you mind the gap. This is the space between the end of the car on the subway and the sidewalk. And there's this little gap in the middle, and they don't want you to drop in so you end up in Hades. Okay? <laughs> so you're supposed to mind the gap between where the car is and where the side of the street is, and you need to pay attention to that gap. Well, that's what we're going to do. I'm going I'm to help you mine the gap between the event in Jesus' life and their recording, and there are three major factors, three major things we have to talk about in order to mine the gap. We have to talk about orality, 
How do they communicate the tradition about Jesus, the events of Jesus, until they recorded it? And I'm also going to explain to you why it took so long to write it down. Second thing we have to pay attention to is memory. Okay, you got to remember what you saw in order to pass it on. So how does memory work? And we're going to talk about some things related to memory. And the third thing we're going to talk about is eyewitnesses. Because those stories have to come from somewhere. And the recording has to come from somewhere. And obviously eyewitnesses is where the story, the accounts, if you will, start. So we've got this trinity of things that we've got to watch as we mine the gap. Okay, they are orality, how do you pass things on orally, they are the issues associated with memory, and they are the things that are tied to eyewitnesses. And what we're saying is in the beginning there was memory and the passing on of the events of Jesus by word of mouth. Now the skeptic claims, as I've already suggested to you, that the tradition was loose, like the memory game, like the telephone game, Chinese whisper. And the second claim is, even if there were eyewitnesses, memory is not really trustworthy enough over time. So those are the two skeptical elements. We've got a gap in which a lot of stuff can happen between the time we get the event and the time that we get it recorded. And the second claim is, and memory isn't really all that great. It's been tested and found to have a lot of leaks. So memory leaks. All right, so that's where we're starting out. So let's see where this takes us. And I've got to move really quick. Let me give you some quotes, okay? This is what Bart Ehrman says about the nature of the Gospels. He says, even the Gospels pose problem for historians. Remember, he's the one who's written the textbook that's in most of the religion classes in secular universities around the country, published by Oxford University Press. Even the Gospels pose problems for historians, however, since they were written long after the facts they narrate by people who had not witnessed the events they described and who relied on inconsistent oral and written traditions about Jesus. That's our gap. Now, he's making several claims, some of which I would contest, but he says none of the materials written by eyewitnesses that's probably not the case for two of the Gospels, Matthew and John. They go back to apostolic roots for sure uh, in the, in the uh, names that are associated with those two Gospels. But he's right about two of them. Mark and Luke are not written by people who walked and talked with Jesus. And, and so two of them are written by apostles. Two of them are written by non-apostles. He would claim that actually none of them are written by the apostles. I would fight with them on two of them, okay? But the point is still there. There's a lot of stuff to deal with. And the fact is that the gospel that's most important to scholars today in many ways is the gospel of Mark. It's viewed as the first gospel likely to have written, and that's probably correct. And it's written by a non-apostle. So, so we've got all kinds of issues here dealing with this gap between the event and the recording. The second citation comes from, from Michael White, who produced a show on Jesus that shows regularly on PBS. It goes back to the late 1990s, early 2000s. He's a professor of classics at the University of Texas at Austin, and this is what he had to say about the Gospels. The problem for any historian of Jesus' life is that we don't have sources that come from the time of Jesus himself. Now that statement you got to parse. Okay? Technically speaking, it is correct. Okay? Technically speaking. Jesus lived and ministered somewhere between 27 and 33. He had about a three and a half year ministry. Scholars debate whether it started in 27 or 30 and whether it ended in 30 or 33, but it's in there somewhere. Our earliest gospels, I mentioned to you, are th written 30 years later. So technically, gospels were not written while Jesus was alive. There is a gap. Okay, but what that citation obscures is that people were alive who wrote the Gospels during the life of Jesus. There's an overlap between the two. So what I want to do is I want to deal with this period that we're dealing with, what I'm calling the gap, and talk about, as I said, three areas. We're going to talk about memory, memory, 
we're going to talk about orality, and we're going to talk about eyewitnesses. Now, what order are we going to do this in? We're going to start with orality. There are, in the ancient world, as people have looked over the way things go, basically three ways to talk about orality and how it works. And there's a debate among scholars as to which of these models is the best. Okay? One of them is called uh, informal, uncontrolled orality. That means there's no one overseeing it. It can be changed. There's no, there's no formal oversight of it. And it's uncontrolled. No one's watching over how it gets passed on. The telephone game is a picture of informal, uncontrolled orality. It circulates with no oversight, and it can go anywhere. That was the view of scholars like Rudolf Bultmann. I'm going to mention some names as we go through here. Probably the most famous German New Testament scholar of the last century. Extremely liberal. He said we hardly know anything about the historical Jesus. Uh, and he thought it was because this gap and things that happened in it were so wide-ranging that there was no way to get back to Jesus. In fact, in historical Jesus studies, it's called the space between the event and the recording is called Lessing's Ditch. Okay? goes back to a guy named Lessing in the, uh, in the early Enlightenment, the early period of New Testament criticism. And he argued there's a difference between the biblical Jesus of the Gospels, the Christ of faith, and the historical Jesus of the events, and there's no way to get over that ditch. Only it's not a ditch. For him it was a canyon. There was no way to get from the Gospel recordings back to the historical Jesus. The gap is that much of a problem. And it is informal orality and the idea of informal orality that takes someone there. There's no oversight. There's no control of this tradition. We have no guarantee that what was written 30 to 60 years later actually reflects what was done and said by Jesus. Well, some scholars pushed back, and they argued for what was called a formal and controlled model on the basis of, now I'm going to have some fun, on the basis of the rabbinic models of the early centuries after the time of Christ. The models on which the informal, uncontrolled orality was built was based on the, on the model of Icelandic folklore. And I have a little geography lesson for you. Iceland is not Israel, okay? Starts with the same letter, but a little bit away away, all right? So we're talking about, we're talking about what models are we going to use to think about this? And some scholars, New Testament scholars, came along and said, no, it was formal and it was controlled like the way the rabbis oversaw Jewish tradition. And so it, it's, it's more precise and only certain people can tell the story. That's what it means by formal and controlled. There were certain people authorized to pass on the tr tradition and it was very tightly controlled and it was very precise. There's only one problem, as wonderful as that sounds. If you read the Gospels in the New Testament, and I'm going to talk about this in the second lecture that I give today, if you read the Gospels in the New Testament, even though the stories are the same, they're told with these little bitty differences that sprinkle all the way through them. They're told, the gist of the core of the story is the same, but there's variation. So the model of formal control with its precision, even down to the exact words, doesn't seem to work with what we have in the Gospels. So people pushed back and said, that model sounds great. It fits the context out of which the Gospels emerge, but that's not what we see in the Gospels. So it was viewed as inadequate. This led to a third proposal. This proposal came from a man named Kenneth Bailey, who lived among Bedouins in the Middle East for several years. He was a missionary to Bedouins. And he said what he saw is what he called informal and controlled. Now that sounds like that's going to run into each other, so just hang with me for a second. Anyone can tell the story, and some variation in telling the story is allowed, in part just for the aesthetics of it. You change the story a little bit, to keep people saying, I know that, I'm not going to listen. 
Okay, so you tell the story with variation, and anyone can tell the story, and the gist is always the same, but there's oversight of the core story. There are elders in the villages who listen to what's being told, and if the story varies too much, they correct. So he called this informal and controlled. And Bailey's claiming that when he listens to the Bedouins that he ministers to in the Middle East, he hears what he sees in the Gospels. Stories told, even the same story, with a little bit of variation, but with gist. And this is a reflection of what he calls informal and controlled orality. And there are many New Testament scholars today who accept this third type as what's going on in the Gospels. So that helps us. Orality isn't as wild and free-ranging as some suggest. It may not be as precise as we might expect, but, and this is the core point, the gist of the story is consistent even as the details are different from place to place because of the way stories get told with some variation to keep someone's interest who knows the story. So that's what you have going on. So that's all I'm going to say about orality. I am in deep trouble for time. Memory. Memory. Let me talk about, let me talk about uh, Robert McIver. Robert McIver is an Australian scholar who wrote a book on memory looking at how studies in memory took place. Um, he actually roomed in the room next to me and my wife on my last sabbatical. He was writing this book while he was doing it. It's a book on Jesus and memory and the Gospels. Now, why is this important? This is important because of, of John Dominic Crossan's claim, a liberal scholar who said, I'll even grant you there are eyewitnesses. I'll even grant you we're dealing with memory. I'll grant you those two things, but... Memory leaks. Eyewitnesses don't remember things accurately. And so even if we acknowledge that there are eyewitnesses, and even if we acknowledge that there is such a thing as memory, memory is so poor we don't remember things well. That was his premise. Now, I heard John John Dominic Crossan give a presentation on memory at SMU because I was asked to respond to John Dominic Crossan at an event at SMU Uh, years ago and he got up and opened the story this way he got up and he talked about memory and how memory leaks and he used the challenger disaster which is a very famous experiment in memory that took place at emory university you all remember the challenger disaster that was the space shuttle that had the junior high science teacher christy mcauliffe as one of the people who was going to go into space and of course it exploded on takeoff You know, it was tragic enough that it exploded at a time when we weren't just sending astronauts into space, made it more traumatic for everybody. And so so we lost this, this everyday citizen, and the whole country was traumatized by it. So Emory said, let's do a let's do an experiment. Let's invite in freshmen and ask them, where were you when you heard or saw about the disaster and how did you hear about it? Two basic questions. Okay, so they did, they asked them in, they recorded the results. Three years later, on the premise that they were now seniors, probably a bad premise, okay? (laughs) Three years later, they invited them back, and they said, let's ask them again. How did you hear about this, and, you know, when did you hear about it, what were the circumstances you heard about it, etc.? They recorded the answers. They compared what they said three years later to what they had said three years earlier. About half of the people gave different answers. Okay? Weren't the same. So they called those folks back and they said, here are the two sets of answers that you gave us. They didn't identify which answer belonged to which period. Which one reflects what you remember? And in most cases, what they did was... They remembered the more recent telling rather than the one that was closer to the time of the event. And so the Emory psychologists who were doing this study concluded that memory leaks. 
This is the only study that does this. There are lots of studies that have done this, and they indicate that memory does change. Memory is impacted by a lot of things. There are, there's now been a whole range of studies that, that look into this area, including some fascinating ones. This isn't on the slide, but including some fascinating ones, the most famous of which may involve John Dean. You remember who John Dean is? These are all illustrations for people who are over 40. Okay? Um, <laughs> John Dean was the key witness in the Watergate episode, and he was said to have had a terrific memory when he testified before Congress about conversations, what exactly was said, when it was said, who said it to whom, all that. Well, of course, you know that part of what came with the Watergate investigation was the discovery of tape recordings, okay, that recorded everything that happened. So some scholar, you know, some scholars have too much time. Some scholar thought, let's compare what John Dean testified to to what the tapes say. Let's see how good John Dean's memory is. Let's test John Dean's memory. So they did this, and what they found was pretty fascinating. They said, John Dean made mistakes all over the place. He had conversations on the wrong dates. The details, he really messed up. But you know what he didn't mess up? He didn't mess up the gist of the story. An interesting set of results. Bart Ehrman, when he talks about this in his own writings, only talks about the fact that John Dean messed up the details. He doesn't tell you that in this very famous study on memory, the person writing it said, but he got the basic story right. He got, he got the problem in the White House with the cover-up basically right. He didn't put the right conversation on the right day, but those conversations did happen. It's an interesting mix. Anyway, I left, you my, I left my, my challenger story hanging. I got asked to respond to John Dominic Crossan at SMU this difference between what the student said right after it happened to what came later. So they asked me to respond, and I responded. I said, well, I have a couple of observations I want to make. The first is that this was a study that involved people who had nothing at stake in what was being remembered. Okay? These students had no investment in the space program other than their patriotism. Okay? They weren't going to ever climb up in that rocket and go up into space. So I asked the question, I wonder what the results would have been if instead of asking students picked at random at Emory University who only have a distant connection to what's happening, as traumatic as it was for the nation, what would happen if you asked the astronauts who would have to climb into that spaceship one day and be shot into space? And I suggested and there have been studies to do, that have been done since that have proven this, that the retention of memory when something is at stake is much better than when it's just a random memory, even if it's a social traumatic memory. And the apostles had something at stake in what they were remembering about Jesus. Their life was on the line in many cases. They aren't going to fabricate things just to get themselves into trouble, unless they're kind of crazy. And yet the stories that they told about Jesus, the accounts that they gave, oftentimes did get them into trouble. They wanted to be sure they would get it right. One of the other points that McIver makes in his book, is he, he talked about this Emory study himself and others, is that after about five years, your memory fossilizes. What gen people generally remember about an event five years down the road is what they remember 20 years down the road. That our mind kind of filters it and puts it into a package, and this is how I remember it. And once you get to five years, it doesn't change very much. And then there's one other important point of difference between the Gospels and the Emory example, and it's this. The stories of Jesus' life were told to be retold. They were told to be remembered. They were repeatedly told. 
in the communities again and again and again and again. And we aren't just dealing with one person's memory. We're dealing with many people's memory. So these are stories to be told to be retained, and corporate memory doesn't equal individual memory. When you get corporate memory, you've got a whole other dynamic now that's happening. So I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about these memory things and how they work, and I'm trying to think about how does orality work? I'm going to skip the top point in the slide and go to the next one. Examples of memory. And so one day I was thinking about this, and I thought, you know, who lives in an oral world in my life? My grandkids do, or they did. There was a time until they were about five or six where they couldn't read or write. Everything that they knew, everything that they absorbed, everything that they learned, they learned by listening and hearing and retaining. And I thought about my grandkids. And I thought about Star Wars. My kids know, grandkids know Star Wars. It is your destiny. <laughs> they know Star Wars. They know Star Wars backwards and forwards. They knew it before they could ever read. Or another example, an example of a repeated story. When my kids were growing up, we used to read these little Bible stories to them, a series produced by Concordia Press. It was the Lutheran Press. It was the st biblical stories put in rhyme with nice pictures. Those were the picture books we read to them before they went to bed at night. And my oldest daughter loved the story of Nicodemus. Now, one of the assignments you have as a father, should you choose to accept it, all right, and this tape will not self-destruct in five seconds, Okay, is to read these stories to your children night after night after night after night after night. And for a parent, this is kind of, you know, I mean, you do it because you love the kid. Let's be honest. All right? So you do it night after night after night after night after night. Well, after a little bit of time, I'm a little mischievous. And so I would read this story, and just to see if Elisa was, you know, on the dime, I'd change the rhyme. And you know what she would do to me whenever I'd change it? Daddy, that's not how it goes. <laughs> she knew the story. That's not how it goes. And then, just to be sure that I understood, she would tell me what it says. Or another example, I now have a granddaughter who is all of two and a half years old. I had a video sent by my daughter to me of my granddaughter in a little I, a, a plastic car that they kind of ride around in in the grocery store, you know, to keep my little daughter, granddaughter entertained. They didn't have that when I was going to the grocery store. I mean, they, our kids are spoiled today. And so she's sitting around, and so there's this little video that she sends to me, and it's my granddaughter, all of two and a half years old, singing Hey Jude. <laughs> okay? Because my, 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 uh, my daughter and her husband are Beatles fans, and they play Beatles all the time. She's singing, Hey Jude, you know, na 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 She knows all the words, even to the point of, Na 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 hey Jude No one taught her any of that She didn't get up one morning and say as a spiritual exercise I'm going to memorize hey Jude Okay No she just absorbed it by the way we do the same thing with hymns We do the same thing with hymns I, don't, I did not get up in the morning when I became an early Christian and said, today my goal is to memorize the four verses of Amazing Grace. You sing it again and again and again and again, and eventually you get the word. So much so that if I go, those words are in your head. That's how orality works. And orality has the capability of working very well when it's repeated 
again and again and again and again. I have other examples. I could talk about what happens when someone dies and a family talks about the memories of the person who died. That's all oral history. And we pass that or orally. I once gave this talk in Australia and New Zealand and a guy came up to me and said, you know what? It even works in a more interesting way if you talk about army stories. If you talk about army stories in battle, the person who's the infantryman will have one set of memories and the person who is the medic will have another set of stories. That is exactly right. Exactly right. So memory does leak, particularly from individuals, but as it becomes corporate, as it becomes repeated, as it becomes important to remember, because there are things at stake, the ability of memory to retain goes up. Okay? You with me? All right. Aren't we having fun? Oh, let's see. Uh, parallels and variations. This is all I'm going to say about parallels and variations. I'm going to talk about this a lot more in the second lecture. In fact, it's the point of the second lecture. What about all those differences? Here's the picture I want you to think about. We've got four Gospels. Okay? Now, some of you are probably mad at God. You're mad at God because we have four Gospels and not just one. Would have saved us a lot of trouble if there had only been one Gospel. Okay? I'd be out of a job. Okay? If there were only one gospel, I'd be out of a job, okay? I wouldn't have all these differences to talk to people about. I'd totally lose the second lecture coming later today, all right? So God wanted to keep me employed. Thank you, Lord, okay? He wanted to keep me employed, and so we have four gospels. These four gospels tell the story of Jesus somewhat differently. Even the same events have little differences between them that drive all the obsessive, compulsive people who live in our world absolutely crazy. Okay? You can tell I'm obsessive compulsive. I pulled out my hair. All right? So, you know, I mean, you know, just, just the way it works. Okay? So, so, you, so you've got these, these little differences. I want to give you a picture to think about the differences from. How many of you are sports fans? Okay, look at that. About as many of you have been to London. That's good. Okay? Now... When there's a play under dispute, what happens? Okay, we put it under further review. Okay, and then there's that funny thing that the referee does where he goes into the camera with the shadow and he goes, oh, no. I sometimes wonder what's happening underneath there. But anyway, so, he, so he's looking, he's looking, and how important is it that we have multiple camera angles on the play in question? Very important. Because one camera angle doesn't capture something the other camera angle does. I like to tell people it's a gift from God that we have Jesus in quadraphonic sound. It gives us a depth about what's going on with Jesus that we would not have if there were only one running account because one particular writer is looking for certain things out of Jesus that another particular writer may or may not be looking for and the second writer may give us things the first writer didn't look for. So the more accounts we have of Jesus, the more full orb the portrait is of what it is that he gives us. God knew what he was doing when he gave us four Gospels. But this introduces some things. Things like what I like to call gal and guy telling. Okay? How do we get, why do we get these differences? Well, some of these differences we get because people tell stories differently. They catch details differently. Here's the illustration. If I ask my wife if I have to be at dinner at 6 o'clock in the evening, my wife will start with the way my day looks from 6 o'clock in the morning and he will, she will take me through, you know, my calendar and then explain all the philosophical reasons that Tom Woodward will be proud of, okay, for why my attendance is required at 6 o'clock dinner, yes or no, okay? If you ask me if my wife has to be at dinner at 6 o'clock, you will get a very concise answer, yes or no, okay? Just a, we're just built differently. We just tell stuff differently. Now, I have a colleague 
He's married to a German wife. This is not a thing of gender. Okay, he's married to a German wife. If you ask Ursula if Hall has to be at dinner at 6 o'clock, she'll say, ja or nine. She's like me. But if you ask Hall, who I nicknamed Dr. Google, Hall knows more about the world and all these facts in the world than any people, than almost anyone I know, and he knows stuff people don't care about, okay? All right, that's why I call him Dr. Google. You can just Google him and you'll get information. He just, it just comes out of him. So if you ask Hall if his wife needs to be at dinner at 6 o'clock at night, he will start with the history of hospitality in the Greco-Roman world, <laughs> okay, and eventually answer the question. He's just built differently. He's just built differently. So, so, so part of what goes on in the way these stories are told to produce these differences are different styles, different concerns, different ways of telling, different ways of summarizing. Some people like to be exact. Some people paraphrase. All those kinds of things. They're all going on between the Gospels. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in the second hour. Oh, man, we are flying. Well, what about this gap? I've got this 30-year gap. There's one other thing I want to cover. Okay, so we've said, yes, there were eyewitnesses. Oh, let me give you one more thing on eyewitnesses. Sometimes get this idea that we really don't know who the authors of the Gospels are. We don't know who the authors of the Gospels are. We don't know. The, the Gospels don't come written with, written by Matthew, written by Mark, written by Luke, written by John. In, if you read any of the Gospels, the names of the authors are nowhere present in those texts. So we have to figure that out on the basis of church tradition and what we know historically. That's what we try and do. Now, a, a liberal scholar says the church didn't know who the authors were, and so they, they assigned people who had reputations as the authors of the Gospels, to lift up their stature and cause them to be accepted. Okay, let's test that theory. Let's take the Gospel of Mark. Okay? Now, in the tradition that we have from the early church, the tradition says that Mark got much of his material from Peter. Okay? So remember, I don't know who wrote the Gospel. It's an X. It's an X I get to fill. And you have the choice between calling this Gospel the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Peter. Okay? So let's look at the resumes. Mark went home to Mama after the first missionary journey. Caused a rift between Paul and Barnabas before the second missionary journey. That is Mark's resume. Okay? Not exactly outstanding, okay, although he did cause people to stand out, okay, so, so you know, so just kind of, you know, it's, it's Mark. Peter, Peter, one of the twelve, one of the three, like the one, okay, so you're sitting there in the audience, you're in the PR marketing meeting, in which we say, we've got a gospel here, we don't have a name for it. We've got to attach a name to someone uh, to give it stature, because we don't know who wrote it. And our two final candidates are Mark and Peter. Who are you going to give it to? Peter wins it hands down. And yet the tradition attributed it to Mark, even knowing the association with Peter, that tells me the tradition knows something. Now, gap. One last, this is the last thing I'm going to do. Let's talk about the gap. And for the gap, I want you to think about Paul. Think about Paul. Oh, I forgot to mention one other thing. This gap. Why did it take the church 30 to 60 years to write down a gospel? Why didn't they, why didn't they do it immediately? One, they were busy, okay, sharing the gospel, okay, so, you know. Given the choice between evangelism and gospel writing, they opted for evangelism, all right? But here's the real reason. Back to orality. In the ancient world, it was believed to be more important to hear someone who went through the event than it was to read it on a page. So as long as you had the apostles alive and talking, you didn't need a gospel, Okay? You might want to record the tradition in the church of what it is that they were saying, and that process was ongoing and was happening. 
But as long as you had the living apostles talking to the church and overseeing the tradition, you didn't need to write it down. Because, Papias tells us, a writer from the early 2nd century, I'd rather hear a living voice than read it on a page. It's basically what he said. Reported to us by Eusebius a couple of centuries later. So, the reason these Gospels are written later is because you had the living voices of the people who were alive at the time to tell the story. You didn't need them until the, until the apostles started dying off. Now you've got to worry about recording. And in fact, if you know anything about the way the Holocaust has worked, there has been a raft in the last couple of decades to do as much recording of Holocaust survivors as could be possible. Why? Because the survivors are dying. Same phenomenon. Okay, now back to the gap, okay? This is the fun part. I love this. Okay, here we go. So I got this 60-year thing, all right, with the Gospels. Well, the theology that's represented in the Gospels is actually represented in the stuff that Paul wrote. Okay? Paul's writings take us back to the 50s. So that gap gets to shrink about 20 years. Okay, so Paul writes, you know, and he's writing... You know, Galatians is generally placed in the early 50s, late 40s, 49, 50, in there somewhere. Okay? So now we're within 20 to 17 years of the death of Jesus. That's not bad, but still a gap. But you don't need to know that it's just the time when Paul writes. Tom was right yesterday to bring up 1 Corinthians 15 and talk about the list of witnesses, etc., because Paul has an experience of Jesus within 18 months of the crucifixion. That experience, he has to be able to process in order to get to the conversion that Paul experiences when Jesus appears. When Jesus appears to him and he says, you know, you know the, the light appears and Paul's kind of stunned and he's sitting there. You know, who are you, Lord, and all this kind of stuff. And he's, you know, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. He's got, to, he's got to know what that means, that Jesus has appeared to him. Which means that he's heard the apostles in the midst of the persecution that he led. He's heard the apostles make the case for Jesus being raised from the dead. Not only that, as a persecutor, starting from Jerusalem... He's in the city where it all happened. He's in the city where it all happened. He was arguing against it when it was first proclaimed. He knows that tomb is empty. He knows they never found a body. He knows the case that was being made against the church. And Jesus appears to him and it dawns on him. You know, light has a way of doing that in the morning. Okay? It dawns on him. Apostles must have been right. Now look what this means. This gap of 60 years, and you know, I'm a good long jumper, but I'm not that good. Okay? <laughs> has all of a sudden shrunk down where the events of Paul step into the very space that Jesus occupied. There's no ditch. There's no gap. There's just a little hop in time. The theology that Paul writes about and embraces in the 50s, he experienced in the early 30s. And it didn't change at its core. So, to use the words of that great theologian, Chris Berman. Okay? When we think of the gap, we can go back, 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 to the beginning. We're literally on top of the events themselves. Here's what I've said to you. I moved quick, but here's what I've said to you. I've said whether we look at when we think about orality, orality is a different kind of memory, remembering, but it doesn't have to be a thing where everything goes everywhere in terms of the story. When it's overseen, watched over, participated in a group, 
participated with people who experienced the things that were experienced and worked over by that group. In fact, the apostles, you know how you know that the apostles had a role in this? When Judas got replaced in chapter 1 of Acts, there was a requirement for the person who replaced him. You know what it was? Had to be with us from the beginning. Let me translate that for you. Had to really know Jesus. Who he was and what he taught. When one is used to orality, it's done better. My kids, before they were taught reading and writing, could lean on, you know, things like iPads and iPods and all the rest of it. Okay, their memory was actually pretty well developed. There are people who tell stories of people who have memorized, you know, the whole of the Old Testament, the whole of the New Testament during this period. If you work at it, you can be pretty good at it. It's not the telephone game. And the core of the story is certainly right. Notice I have not invoked inspiration in anything I have said to you. The core is certainly right. These guys hung out with Jesus for three and a half years. Certainly they understood whether he presented himself as Messiah or not. Certainly got that. I was at Duke two weeks ago in a graduate class. And I was mentioning three and a half years. And, of course, we've got skeptical students in the audience. So they say, oh, three and a half years, you're accepting the chronology of John. I said, okay, let's just make it a year, which is what you might get out of just the synoptic gospels by themselves. I said, it doesn't make any difference. They were with him every day for a year. Probably knew what he said and taught in terms of the basic things that he was about. Probably came with the territory. I'm saying to you that when you mine the gap, it's not as great a gap of time as it's sometimes made out to be. And I've said the importance of Paul is that he knew the debate, he knew the events, he even argued against the events at the time, he knew the tradition, he was in Jerusalem at the time, and our gap is no longer a gap, it's just a little sidestep. We're not talking about the telephone game when we mine the gap. We're talking about people who understood that the accounts that were tied to Jesus were worth remembering. And remembered it and passed it on. And we can be grateful that they did that because, as amazing as it sounds, we stand on their shoulders. We would know nothing about Jesus if their stories, which they originally told orally, hadn't been recorded for us for perpetuity in the Gospels that we have. Thank you very much.